Hello and welcome to today's lesson where we're looking at Porter's five forces. In this video, we'll explain the model and bring the model to life using an example. So Porter's five forces is a method for analysing and understanding the competitive forces that are shaping a marketplace. And it is especially useful when you're thinking of entering a new market or starting a new business. It helps you to understand the nature of competition within a market and from this you can understand how profitable the market is and in the model that's referred to as market attractiveness. But before we jump into the model, we need a little bit of context. So Porter's by forces works by analysing factors at what's called the meso level and meso level forces are those external forces in direct contact with the company. And they sit between the macro and micro levels of analysis. So at the macro level, this has a one-way effect on the firm and the firm has no control over these factors. So for example, if the government changes the tax rate, there's nothing the firm can do about it. The micro level is the opposite. It's internal to the organization and entirely under the organization's control. So if a firm wants to change the color of its website, it can go straight ahead and make that happen. So the meso level sits between these two levels. And whilst firms can influence meso level factors, they don't have complete control over them. Now, the real power of Porter's five forces is that it gives you a starting point to think about how you can shape meso level forces to be in your favor so that your organization increases its profit margin and becomes more profitable. Now, at a very high level, Porter's five forces says that the higher competitive forces are, the lower the profit potential and the less attractive an industry. And conversely, the lower the competitive forces, the higher the profit potential and the more attractive that industry is. Now, it's important to understand that by analysing an industry using this framework, you're just looking at a snapshot in time. But over time, the forces can and will change. So, for example, it might be hard to enter a particular market today because of high barriers to entry, but this might not be the case in 10 or 20 years from now. So with that, let's jump in and take a look at each of the five forces in turn. So first we have existing competitor rivalry, and this sits right in the middle of the diagram. Now the intensity of competition is driven by the number of competitors within the industry and how similar their products are. Now if rivalry is intense, this will drive down profits, push down profits across the industry. So fierce rivalry results in firms offering deep discounts and spending large sums on marketing to acquire new customers. Now, when rivalry is intense, it's often easy for customers to substitute your firm for another. So for example, a flight from London to Paris is a flight from London to Paris. Does it really matter who you fly with? And the opposite is also true. So when you have few rivals and you're positioned uniquely in the market, then it's hard to substitute another product for yours and that means you can charge more and that's going to improve your profit margins. And this is the reason that Apple can charge more for their laptops than Dell can charge for theirs because of their unique positioning. Now competition between existing firms is at the center of the diagram and that is to indicate that all the firms jockeying for position within the industry are surrounded by four other powerful forces. So the second force is the threat of new entrants and the threat of new entrants puts a limit on how profitable a market can be. And that's because the threat alone will force you and your competitors to keep your prices low to discourage new entrants. So if it's easy for new firms to enter your market and compete, then profits will obviously be lower across the industry. Now, how easy or difficult it is for a new firm to enter the market will depend upon the industry's barriers 
to entry. Now, firms create high barriers to entry by doing things such as possessing unique intellectual property or unique technology, benefiting from economies of scale, having high brand loyalty or using vertical integration amongst others. So let's take a quick look at how a fashion firm such as Louis Vuitton might create a barrier to entry. Now, one way they try to do this is through vertical integration. And vertical integration is where a firm owns its suppliers and its distribution channels. So you can see in this image one of Louis Vuitton's stores or one of its distribution channels, and it owns all its own retail stores. So if a new entrant wants to enter the market to compete directly with Louis Vuitton, then having to set up lots of stores to take them on head to head is a huge barrier to entry. Now, the third force is buyer power. And if your customers are powerful enough to force you to reduce your prices, then profits will be lower across the industry. Buyer power will be highest when there are few buyers, products are undifferentiated from each other, and the cost of switching from one supplier to another is low. So when buyers have power, they can play rival firms against one another. And of course, that drives prices down across the industry. The fourth power is the threat of substitution. So how easy would it be to swap your product for an alternative product? Now, this threat isn't about replacing your product with an identical product, but about your customers finding another way to achieve what your product does. So for example, customers might choose to replace your airline's flights with video conferencing software. The rise of working for, from home, for example, may limit the rents that commercial office owners can charge. Now the existence of substitute products will place a limit on the ceiling price you can charge. And again, this has the overall effect of limiting profitability across the industry. So the final force is supplier power. Your supplier's power is determined by how easy it is for your suppliers to raise their prices. The fewer suppliers there are, and the more unique their product, then the more power they have. Now, it's easy for a supplier to raise their prices when their product is unique, and you can't switch to another supplier. Now, if you find yourself in a situation where your suppliers have high power, then they will be able to and probably should raise their prices and that will squeeze your profits because you'll have no other option but to absorb those increased costs. Now, when this happens, your supplier captures profit from your industry and profits across your industry are reduced. So now that we've gone through all of the five forces, you should have a better understanding of what constitutes a high profit versus a low profit industry. And that is summarized in this table. And as you can see, high profit industries have few rivals, low threat of new entrants, weak buyers, products that are difficult to substitute, and weak suppliers. And low profit industries are characterized by the exact opposite features. Now, one nuance to be aware of with Porter's five forces is that you should focus on persistent forces impacting profitability and not temporary forces that may make an industry look more attractive. So an example of a temporary force which won't persist is high industry growth rate. That might make an industry look really attractive right now, but when that high growth rate disappears in seven, eight years time, then is it really still such an attractive industry? So to bring all this together, let's look at an example. And for this example, we're going to look at the launch of Apple's original iPhone. Now, in 2005, six companies dominated the cellular phone business, capturing about 90% of the global handset business. Now, the largest was Nokia with almost a third of the worldwide market. And despite the market growing by 21% in 2005, if you were to analyze it using Porter's five forces, then you might summarize the market 
as you can see in this slide. So first, in the middle, we have existing rivalry between competitors. Now this is intense. Manufacturers are constantly adding new features to attract customers, but overall, products are somewhat similar. Next, we have the threat of new entrants. This is actually low because, because of the vast economies of scale that are held by the major players in the industry and their patents. Next, we have buyer power. This is actually high. So buyers number in their hundreds of millions each year, but they actually have high bargaining power because the devices are so similar. And that means that these manufacturers have to heavily discount and heavily market their products to attract customers. Next, we have the threat of substitution. This is actually moderate. In the mid 2000s, cell phones were used to keep in touch via phone calls and exchange text messages. So potential su substitute products include things like email, Skype and landlines. Now, finally, we have supplier power and this is low. There are multiple possible suppliers for most components. So the power of suppliers is relatively low. So as you can see in 2005, the mobile device market was highly competitive with several big players dominating the market. Now, although the market was growing massively year on year, this is a temporary factor. So putting all this together, you'd be forgiven for concluding that the market is an undesirable one as there is massive competition amongst existing players combined with you know, high buyer power pushing down prices across the industry. But obviously, you know, Apple didn't look at this market and run. Instead, they entered the market and were highly successful. And they did this by adapting the five forces so they were in their favor. And the way they did that included, you know, in terms of existing competitor rival rivalry, then that wasn't really an issue for the iPhone because that product was so unique. The threat of new entrants would go down over time because of Apple's ecosystem. The more people joined the ecosystem, the harder it was to set up a new ecosystem. And why would developers switch to a new entrant when all their money is being made with the Apple ecosystem? In terms of buyer power, then that gets reduced because there is no direct natural alternative. The threat of substitution is lower than before because the features of the iPhone were probably closest to a computer or a laptop, but those things had the disadvantage of not being handheld and kind of hard to carry around. And finally, supplier power remains low as before. So in a nutshell, Apple influenced the five forces of Porter's model so that they were all blowing, those forces were working in their favor. And that's the real power of the model that you can shape these forces to make your business more profitable and unassailable. So there are some advantages and disadvantages associated with the model. In terms of advantages, then the framework is easy to understand and it's also easy to use. The framework helps you to assess the attractiveness of an industry. And from this, you can you know, choose to enter the market or not enter the market. You can select your strategy to defend against these forces, or you can position yourself so that you try to shape the forces. In terms of disadvantages, then the model analyzes the industry as a snapshot in time, a single point in time. But in reality, of course, the industry is constantly changing because of the new strategies and tactics adopted by the firms that make up the industry. Suppliers having power is assumed to be a negative in the model, but many organizations these days use joint ventures and affiliations, so everybody thrives. Now, the model alone isn't enough to enable a company to set its strategy. It'll also need to consider multiple other factors, one such being, you know, the organization's strengths and weaknesses. And finally, you can argue that a company's positioning is more important for profitability than the industry in which it operates. 
And a really good example of that is the iPhone example that we've just been through where the industry didn't really look attractive, but Apple was able to enter it and dominate it and make it look like it, it make it attractive for it. So in summary, Porter's Five Forces is a framework that can help you understand an industry's attractiveness at a moment in time. It does this by examining the fundamental forces driving the profitability of an industry as a whole, existing competitor rivalry, the threat of new entrants, buyer power, the threat of substitution, and supplier power. The model essentially says that the higher the competitive forces, the lower the industry's overall profit potential. And conversely, the lower the competitive forces, the higher the profit potential of that industry. Now, as we've discussed, the real power of Porter's five forces is that it gives you a starting point to think about how you can shape the five forces so that they are in your favor. So that's it for this lesson. Really hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon.